Not only is it unforgettable and unforgivable, the abduction and murder of James Bolger remains unthinkable. How could two ten-year-old boys snatch a two-year-old toddler away from his mother in a busy shopping centre and then savagely torture him to death? Three decades on, it's a crime that continues to traumatise police who worked on the case. In tonight's special program, British detectives take us inside their investigation. We hear the chilling interviews they conducted with killers Robert Thompson and John Venables, and they recount the horrific moment they realised these children were capable of such evil. And for the first time, James's three younger brothers speak publicly about the enormous loss their family has endured. I've always lived in Liverpool. Um, I think it's a great city. Basically, like one big family. Even back in the 90s, it was the same. <laughs> always wanted to be a mum. Um, coming from a big family, I've always loved being around kids. James was loved by all. But as he, he started taking more and more steps, he didn't then walk into a room, he run into a room. He loved to make people laugh. He was a little character. It was a really cold morning. I did put a big thick coat on him, his hat, his gloves, scarf. A girlfriend comes walking in. She says, I'm going to Beatles Strand. Do you want to come? I went, yeah, I'll come with you. That was the biggest mistake of my life. Strand Shopping Centre in Bootle is uh, probably the only shopping centre in Bootle, actually. It's, it's been there since 1966, I think. I was actually the beat officer for the Strand for about a year, so I got to know all the shops and all the set out of the Strand really well. We weren't long in the Strand at all. On the way out, I decided to stop off at the butchers. James was starting to run all around the shop and I thought, this is not good. And I had to hold of his hands and within seconds of me reaching for my purse to pay for the chops that I had bought, I looked back down and that's when I discovered he'd gone. I ran into the reception and, and said, you know, my little boy's gone missing and he said, okay, we'll put it over the tannoy and, um, We'll get, get the words out there. The longer it gets, I mean, I think even a minute of losing your child seems like an hour. It, you, you, your head's just all over the place. You just want a slice of them. You just want to grab a hold of them. I got a call saying that um, there's a child missing. You have this thing, this golden hour where you're searching. And James had been missing for about 40 minutes, so already we'd eaten into that before we even started. So things started being geared, geared up at the station and people were coming out. As soon as you hear them words, police are getting called and you know it's serious. Denise at that time, obviously, she was very, very upset, so it was quite difficult at times to, to make out what she was saying and to, and to sort of keep her on the the details that we needed from it. Well, I was trying to sort of find out what sort of little boy James was and whether or not, you know, he would... He was the sort of kid who would wander off on his own or not. 
It was getting late on as well, started getting dark. I had visions of him being out there somewhere in the dark, freezing cold, and I just needed to get him back. I had dealt with missing children, nothing on this scale. I can remember actually what the, the call. It was, it was an unusual call because they would inform me about an incident that would generally not be escalated to the CID. The scale of the investigation, even prior to my arrival, was significantly higher than you would expect. But this wasn't a normal situation. All of the available officers in Bootle were involved in the search. The shops were shut, and the police asked me to go to the police station. And I did find it really hard because I thought once I leave here, yeah, it's, it's leaving that place, it's leaving that point of where you last seen your child and you're leaving that shop without them, but you walked in with them. And it, it's just, it was such a hard thing for me to do. I was really, really worried about James because of the proximity of the canal. That was my big fear, actually, at that time, is if James had been wandering uh, and the thought of, you know, access to that canal is, is relatively easy. My eyes was everywhere. I felt like it was just going to explode. I don't think they knew what to say or were they blaming me? I, I don't know. We had to interrogate the CCTV system. About 10 past one, we were still there, and I got, a, I got a message from one of the detectives who said he'd seen something on cameras that he really wanted me to look at uh, as soon as possible. Clearly, you could see James hand in hand with, with, with two other boys um, being led away uh, in, in the strand. You had to look twice because it was surprising. And I remember having to think, what does that mean? It, 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 was, just, it was just something I, did, I just didn't expect to see. From that moment then, the focus and the priorities changed. We knew that, that, that James hadn't walked out of the Strand alone. He had walked, or had been, certainly uh, guided away from, uh, from his mother by two other boys. It was an abduction. James was abducted from way over the, the, the far end of the strand, which is sort of right across the other, the other end on, on the ground floor. And he's marched at some speed from one end of the strand to the other end of the strand, hand in hand, walking out through this door. Denise had just to realise that James had gone missing. She'd be searching the neighbouring shops. She'd be asking people, have you seen my, have you seen my little boy? And be thinking he's there nearby, as everybody would. Yet, yeah, the shocking thing for me is that, it, but it took just over one and a half minutes, one minute, 31 seconds, I think it was, to, from James being um, taken to actually leaving the strand. I do remember the press conference. I didn't care about the cameras. I was just more concerned about getting my voice out there to get James back. I wanted to let people know that he was mine, not theirs. And if you've got him, I need him back. I want him back. Just buying me out the butchers. Turns away from for a minute and then I'll sign. 
do have a number of video uh, photographs from the precinct itself showing the boy quite clearly, apparently following two youths that we're very anxious to trace. It may well be that um, the child did follow them, so it is very important that we do trace these two boys. If you've got me, baby, to come on back. Well, thank you very much, please. Your first thought is, well, it's two kids taking him away. That, that's good, rather than sort of being an adult. Two children taking him off, perhaps they've taken him home, perhaps they've, they're, they're sort of taking him off to play or something like that, you know. How bad can it be? Because they were clearly juveniles, I felt in my own mind, I don't know if it was me being positive, that it's, it's likely to be less sinister than if it was an adult. You know, it, it might be a prank that's gone wrong. I felt relieved. I thought, I'm, I'm going to get him back here. There's no way they're going to be able to hear him. They're too young to hear him. When I saw the images, it gave us something to go to. But it was confusing. So then I said, keep going and see what else we get. See how many other images we get and see whether we can track him, which way would they be going, what, what camera. Close-ups of the security photos don't reveal the youth's identities, but police say they're both white teenagers, one wearing a leather jacket. Hello, Mr. Police Melkin. Throughout Saturday, there was enough, a lot of information coming in. Too much information for our team to process. Parents were keeping tight hold of their children today outside the shopping centre from where two-year-old James Bulger was apparently abducted. Well, we've got, you know, James, James being led away by two boys. Who have we got around them? We need to get those images out because we need to identify the people who are the witnesses because they're seeing them full on. But at the same time, our, our, our focus was on really searching. I got a feeling it wasn't looking good as the days were going on. Um, I thought of two, two lads as, as him. Well, are they too scared to pass them back now because it's gone out there, you know, it's all, all over the news, all over the papers. You know, are they too frightened to now pass them back? It's now well over 30 hours since James went missing from this shopping centre. The already serious concerns for his safety have been further heightened as he faces his second night away from his parents. Despite the fact that, that we'd, we'd seen him taken away, I really believed that we'd, we'd find James on Saturday. I really did. And then, uh, and then on a Sunday, they just said, we need to go up to Walton Lane because uh, they found the body. Officers combed waste ground near a reservoir this morning. A member of the public said she saw a boy like James with some youths here yesterday. Local residents were asked to check their gardens, but so far there's no sign of the missing toddler. We were informed of a missing child at 20 past four. At 20 past four, James was not far short of the reservoir. So at 20 past four, everybody is looking around in shops for a boy that's missing. And these boys, with purpose, with determination, with speed, are at a mile away.
I decided that I would take Denise out in a police car and just give her some fresh air, basically, just to sort of keep her occupied for a while. Mandy said, come on, we'll go for a little drive round just to see if we can see him. And as we're driving round, Mandy gets it a call. And I got a call saying, um, come back to the police station immediately and switch your radio off. So obviously I'm sitting next to her, so I'm hearing what's going on. And I went, how come you've been called back to the station? She went, I don't know. I went, you do? She went, no, I don't. She went, honestly, I don't know. I went, you do? I said, because I know. I said, they found him. And I knew, I knew then that he'd been found. And I knew it wasn't going to be good. Lying protected under a police tent, the body of a boy found this afternoon by officers hunting for two-year-old James Bulger. The body was discovered on a railway line over two miles from where he disappeared. They just said there's a body on the railway. I was praying it wasn't James. I still wasn't convinced until I actually saw it in my own eyes. I've experienced most things in life, lots of tragedy. This was different, totally different, and you just couldn't put your finger on it as to why and why cause so many injuries. It's almost like someone places a veil over your face, a black veil, and you can't see beyond that veil. You, you hear voices, but you, you, don't, you can't hear the words. She let out this terrific scream and then just sort of, um, just sort of collapsed on, in, in on herself. But it was just terrible to hear. I just felt numbness. I was a mum without her baby. But even then, I, was, I think I was still in denial. I think, I thought, you know, They've got it wrong. It, it, it can't, this can't be true. The ultimate objective was always to return James safe and well to the family. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the realisation that that wasn't going to happen was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was devastating. A lot of the bobbies had got kids of their own. And I think that was it. This could be any child, you know, it could have happened to anybody. I did go for the identification of James's body when um, James's uncle went to identify him. It came out and it, it was just speechless and broken. It was, it was terrible to see. The circumstances surrounding the way the body was left at that time, we couldn't really have an opinion on, on what had happened. What it was clear, though, you know, it was... Uh, yeah, it was devastating, devastating injuries. It was definitely not an accident. All evidence that pointed out to be a, a murder. Our job was to identify children in the area between 10 and 18 who had been involved in sort of assaults and violent behaviour. Somewhere, some parent must know the time the children were out, the time they come back and the clothes they were wearing. It's got to be somebody must know. My name is Laurie Dalton. I was a detective constable for 26 years in Merseyside Police. So I was, I was called over, and there's a conference at Stanley Road Police Station. We were all told that James had been found, and now it was definitely a murder inquiry. 
The blurred images of two youths seen taking James away are now all over the city. The public say detectives hold the key to finding them. You know, you have a situation where we see two boys taking James away. We don't know what's happened to James, but clearly it's going to be a bad situation. We were working our way through any leads, the different photographs, the different images, working on the CCTV, but there was so much going on. The, the, the images were such that you couldn't make out any detail. When I gave the description, I think I said something between 12 and 15. It was an area where there was a lot of children that had been in trouble with the police. And of course, they were rounded up and they were interviewed. I, mean, I think over the course of the investigation, over 60 individuals, were, 60 boys, were either brought in for question or questioned. So I repeat the, the appeal that we've, we've made. Anyone, friends, family or whatever, you know, we must interview these two boys because if we don't, we can't guarantee anyone's safety until they've been arrested. You know, I wasn't concentrating on what was going on on the outside world. I just locked myself in a room and you know, when I finally got to watch the news, I could see the, you know, how angry people were and, you know, I felt, I felt and I sensed the love for James in the city. One of the points in, in where James' body was found, that, that evidence meant that James had travelled, probably on foot, from the Strand to Walton Lane. There was a business called Amic. They had a, a, a camera that was covering their car park. And when the, um, when the owner returned to work, he had a look at it. He saw the images of, uh, of, of James with two boys walking past. So when the images came back to us, there's a small wall, and we thought, that, that gives us a, a benchmark, maybe, for, for height. You know, it's not 100% because of the poor images, but we had to open our mind to the fact that instead of looking at a 12 to a 15 year old, you know, we might be dealing with smaller children here. But the idea that it could be done by juveniles or even children was, you know, it was off the scale. We got a breakthrough. I got a call from a police officer in, in Walton Lane who told me somebody had been into Walton Lane. It was a bit beside herself, really. Uh, she'd been at a family friend's on, on Friday the 12th and, and their son, he'd come home <coughs> in a right mess, dirty, bits of paint on his jacket, and uh, he'd been sagging with another lad from the same school. He's only 10. He looks a bit like it could have been him on the foot on the photo, but you know, it's, it's probably not. That's all she said, I just want to let you know. And his name is John Venables. She said he went to St Mary's uh, School in, uh, in Bedford Road. So I got the, the number of the, uh, the headmistress. You know, I said to her, look, it was John Venables at school on Friday, and she said no, he was sagging with Robert Thompson. I said, can you tell me about the Thompson family, who she knew really well, uh, the fact that he was a he was a persistent truanter. The Thompson family lived in, in Walton Village there, relatively close to, to where James was found. I select certain detectives if they come out in the morning, if they're available. Of course, they were quite eager 
I said, well, we are going for two 10 year old boys, so don't have your hopes up too much. I've arrested quite a few kids, but there's no way I could relate to a, a child actually committing a murder. They went to, to the home address as we, we had it from the school. Said, listen, this is why we're here. We want you to come to Low Lane, ask some questions. Have you got the coat that you were wearing when you went, you know, when you were sagging on Friday? A few things were said, odd things, not necessarily admitting being in the strand, but I think Venable said uh, at one stage, you know, are you going to speak to Robert? Myself and the officers, the delegate office, go round to Thompson's house. I knocked on the door. The mother came to the door. I told him why I was there and I wanted to speak to Robert. And then I see Thompson and his eyes are everywhere. And never did I ever see from the moment I met him to all the time I was dealing with him, did I ever see him in fear. I sit him down and I start speaking to him why I was there in simple kids' language and that I needed to take him from his house for him to answer some questions in the police station. That's when he started to cry. I got a call off Phil. I remember saying, Jim, these are, these, these are, these are little children. I said, uh, I can't consider that this little lad would do this. I couldn't believe a 10-year-old could cause so much suffering. So they were arrested at seven. The first interviews didn't take place until 5 p.m. But from the first moments that they were, they were brought in, Venables' mother had said, and what Venables had said, he was going to say he wasn't in the Strand. He said that the two of you were in the Strand and that you saw the little boy. We never. We never. There was a bit of evidence that we got from this shop here, the manager reported to the police that on the morning of the 12th, two boys who they were 100% convinced were the same boys who abducted James, they were hanging about by the door and they had their fingers all over this pane of glass. So what the detective did when fingerprint and take all of the marks from all of the glass at the front. And as a result of, uh, of those lifts, those fingerprint lifts, we were able then to match them immediately to John Venable's fingerprints. Despite what he said, he was in the Strand. When you interview a child, not only do you need all the evidence, but you have to prove that they know what's the truth and that they know it's wrong, what they've done. So, right and wrong, truth or lies. This interview has been tape recorded. I'm Detective Sergeant Roberts. Now, what's your full name? Robert Thompson. I then started interviewing and sort of getting involved with the story, what they were doing that day. I'm Dominic Lloyd. I was Robert Thompson's solicitor at the time of the case. A solicitor arriving at a police station can normally expect to do a lot of waiting. 
in this case, there was none of that. We started work straight away because that's the only work that was being done there. It was a small interview room. So just picture it. Table, wall, and the tape machine. What do they call you, Robert or Bobby? Robert. I think Bobby's a, a more friendly name, do you agree? Yeah. He wasn't frightened. He wasn't phased by any of it. Some people might say, because he didn't understand what was going on. He knew what was going on. I just want to know a little bit about you now, OK? What's your hobby, then? Skipping school. <laughs> Skipping school, is that right? That's not a hobby, that's a profession, Bobby, when you do it as well as you. I really could not bring myself to believe that he had any involvement in this. Just from his youth, just from how small how young, how childlike he was. Bobby, I came round to your house this morning, didn't I? Yeah. And um, what did I say to you? No lesson. Correct. What for? James. James, what, what about James? That you said on suspicion of murder him. Well, very well remembered. Robert Thompson's interviews, he admitted quicker he was in the strand. I think at one stage, really early on, he says he saw James with his mother. Did you ever see him in the strand? You shook your head again. Yeah. Bobby, was that on the day that we're talking about? Was that on Friday. this Friday? Yes. Yeah. yeah. We were going up the escalators, and they were going through the doors that this load was off. Who was he with? No. Little James. With his mum. And then his interviews quite quickly get to the stage where he has uh, John taking his hand and, and taking him out. He was just running around, was he, James? Yeah. Will you tell me exactly what? Slowly, right? Just like coming And then he. He grabbed his hands and walked up to stand. The boy was streetwise. That was one thing about Robert Thompson. He was quite confident in himself. I don't think he recognised the fact that what he'd done was that bad. How did he come up to, to John? How did he come up to John? James. No, he was walking around the strand. Who was? James? The baby. Was he? I told him to take him back. He did what? I told him to take him back. You told him to take him back? All right, Bobby. <laughs> no, it's you're not getting all the blame. I'm just asking your son. The yeah. signs of violence. Will you still make the blame? Wait a minute, Bobby. <laughs> he was switched on. Definitely switched on. And he was trying to calm me. Trying very hard. We knew, even before we started interviewing them, that they'd been in the Strand, because the, the fingerprints put them there. And he said that you took him by the hand and led him out of the Strand shop. He never. He's a liar. Calm down, my gosh. All right, all right, come on, right, 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 look. You know, there's no moment of euphoria. Yeah, we've got them. There was one desire, and that was to get to the truth. When you arrest a young child for something horrendous as it was, you've got to try and build a friendship. Otherwise, they'd oppose you and would not speak to you at all. You see, little James is following you up on stage. 
right? Mm-hmm. But on another picture, John, it appears as if John had hold of his hand. Yeah, well, why, why are you questioning me and this and John as well? There was nothing coming from Edibles, but he was a different character altogether. The first and second interview, Venables just told us about how he was playing through and getting up to mischief, never being near the strand. But the God knows truth. God knows truth. I'm, I'm telling you that we never. He was too scared. He was probably too scared. John saying to us that he wasn't down at the strand. But we were. I know you were at the strand, but why should he lie to us by saying that he wasn't in the strand? He's scared of saying that he was down in the strand because something happened. Didn't they? Not the bank got tough. Yeah. Not by me. I know the truth. I believe so I know I, the truth. I was there. That's right. You waved. Correct, but I know there's a lot of things that have gone on. Yeah, well, do you know what you need? That killed them. It wasn't. I never even killed them. <laughs> <laughs> Thompson was calculating. He cried whenever there was an awkward situation and he was immediately given a Mars bar and a can of Coke. And he latched onto this because when I say he cried, there was not a drop of water. There wasn't a tear. He thought he was going home because he kept on asking, well, am I going home? 2055. We don't know yet, we don't know yet. And I want you to tell no, me. I don't need to answer any more questions, do I? I come on now, Bobby. Yeah, well, I would not want to kill him when I've got a baby of my own. I'm trying if to. I wanted to kill a baby, I'd kill a... I'd my own, wouldn't I? That is a warp mind. Very rare in kids' minds. It's a chilling thing to say with hindsight. At the time, it simply seemed to be part of a pattern of desperate lying, of desperately just trying to talk about anything else other than this. Was he able to talk? Yeah. James? Yeah. What did he say to you? I want me to... That's quite a bit cold, very eerie, the fact that he actually said it in the way James would have said it. Once he started to admit that he was the one with Venables to leave the Strand, that's when your heart is pumping and you feel like punching the air. Now you want to go further. At the end of interview three, we tell him that Robert Thompson has already told us that he's been in the Strand. And then he admits being in the Strand. Yeah, we was, but we never saw any kids there. We never robbed any kids. <coughs> so you were in Bootle New Strand? Yeah, was you in Bootle Strand? Yeah, we never got a kid, Mum. We never. We never got Mrs. a kid. Mrs. would you... Um, I must ask you not to get angry with it. I never got the boy. I never killed him, Mum. And then he admits, yeah, being with James, and, and then... Taking, taking James. So we walked up to him and we were walking around with him and I took his hand. And whose idea was it to walk towards him? Mine. Was it? Then it was Robert's idea to kill him. That's when I felt sort of boom. You get a bit of a thud thinking, oh my God, we have got the right kids. John Venables was frightened of upsetting his mother. Susan just, you know, said to him, look, you know, we'll always love you, we'll always support you. You really need to tell the truth. And so that was the breakthrough then that led to the next interview. A short while ago, as is detailed on your custody record out there, you had a conversation with your mum and you then requested that myself 
come into the room. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And what was it you told us? That Colonel James. You know, he, he actually said those words, you know, I killed him. In a private room, his mother sat with John and basically said, you need to tell the truth, we'll support you, don't be worrying, and, and basically he said, I killed James, I killed him. And what was it you told us? That I killed James. It was really difficult to consider that anybody could carry out those type of injuries to another individual. The idea that it could be someone as young as 10 was difficult to comprehend. And we went outside to the canal. What for? I don't know, he said, let's have thrown him in the water. He was persuading him. He said, kneel down and let's look at the water and all that, but he wouldn't. Because when we wouldn't get him down, not we picked him up and threw him on the floor, and that's where he got his bump on his head. This then became the difficult part, because now we've got two 10-year-olds who have killed a two-year-old, and we have to then make sure that we provide all the evidence that we can to show what happened. What were you gonna, why are we taking you on to Lotton Village? Don't know, we didn't know what to do. You walk along where? To the train track. We took him on the rail track and started throwing bricks at him. Venables sought to remove himself from any of the most violent actions, putting them all down to Robert Thompson. I didn't throw any bricks, because Robert said, pick up your hop and throw it, and just threw it on the floor. We were getting information coming through that uh, he was now blaming Thompson. We certainly admitted throwing stones and things like that. But he's blaming you for a lot of things. Yeah, well, why Do you understand? Is me? Well, I want to know the truth, right? The whole truth. There's other things going on, isn't there? They both started blaming each other. Me. We're asking you, son, <laughs> and we want you to tell you the truth, us the truth, that's all. Not give the blame to you or anything else. But it, it's only the truth that we're yeah, saying. Yeah, but Johnny threw a brick in his face. Can we just go through slowly, right, what John did with what, right? Yeah. You said he got hit with a brick first, didn't he? Then what did he do? Another brick. He threw another brick. These are the boys that took James. We had the individuals responsible. What was Robert saying while he was doing all this? He was saying, stay down, you stupid dick and all that. Why do you want him to stay down? I don't know. I wanted him dead properly. Where did the stones in the bar hit him? In the head. And you said the bar knocked him out? Yeah. Onto the railway track. And what happened then? No, he was just lying there. It's a finish now, because I can't speak anymore. By the time the interviews are over, John has made an admission. Robert hasn't, and said it was all John. And John has tried to push and blame in Robert's direction. And that was the point at which we left the police interviews. And that remained the case throughout the time that I was acting for him and through to trial. That story didn't change.
We had enough evidence. Once we have enough evidence, we charge. boy standing on the other side of the charge desk. He can't even reach the top of the desk. And when he got charged, I thought, how could you, as a 10-year-old boy, cause so much misery to a person's life? Two 10-year-old boys from the Walton area have been charged with the abduction and murder of James Bulger. Well, I was kind of relieved because I knew that he couldn't go and take another child because I strongly believe that they weren't caught when they were. They would have gone on to do because they would have got away with it. From early this morning, local people, still furious at the death of James Bulger, began to gather outside South Sefton Magistrates Court. You want to give them to the people and let them sort them out. Let them go, let them go, let them go, they chanted. Bastards! I don't know what I imagined those going to see when those two boys came into court. You know, what kind of monsters I conjured up in my mind. But you couldn't have expected to see anything more ordinary and more unprepossessing than these two tiny little boys looking very lost and bewildered who, who were led into the courtroom. When I got out the funeral car, I just seen two sides of the road lined with people, but I just put my head back down because I just wanted the day to be over. Something in James Patrick has touched the whole world. We wish so much that we could bring James back. I also kept thinking, I, was, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't have to do this. I should not be putting my child down there. It was a real sense of loss because you, you felt he was like your own, really. That's the way I felt. In two separate police vans, the youngest defendants to face murder charges this century arrived at Preston Crown Court this morning. Conviction was out of our control, really, but we sought a conviction because that would be the justice that the Bulger family deserved. I just wanted them to spend many years behind bars. Police and lawyers have spent the nine months since James Bulger's death gathering evidence for the case. Richard Henriquez, Queen's Counsel, leading prosecuting counsel. I felt more emotionally involved than I have done in any other case, and seeing two 11-year-olds in that uh, dock was a shock in itself. In relation to Robert, I think he was frightened of it. He understood that there would be enormous attention on the trial. There would be crowds outside court and they would be likely to make attempts at the vehicle he was in. 
fact that the boys were intimidated, well, at the end of the day, they did what they did. And if, if, if they were then scared by going into court, well, tough. The witnesses that actually appeared got very, very upset because I think they felt such guilt at not being able to stop it and the fact that they, they hadn't actually intervened to the point where they'd taken James off these two boys. James was apparently seen by dozens of people on his journey. Eleven of them came to court today. Many said they thought he was with older brothers. I don't blame them witnesses whatsoever. Yeah, he could have been saved by one, maybe more. No one expects a two ten-year-old to take a child and do what they've done. I am convinced that they had one intention, and that was intention to kill him. They're just plain evil. The forensic evidence was chilling. 42 separate injuries to James a minimum of 30 separate blows, either with bricks, stones, a metal object, or feet to the body of James. So it was a prolonged, shockingly violent attack, uh, which um, frankly could uh, have had no other purpose uh, other than to kill. Thompson's trainers had been removed uh, without untying the laces. The police had seized his trainers. They were able to take an imprint of the laces as they were tied. It was a double bow. Uh, there were some very marked uh, D-rings, they were called, um, through which the laces had been laced. The evidence as to why these marks were made by Robert's footwear and ultimately the evidence concluded where the scientist had taken a, a life-size doll and the footwear and placed the footwear in contact with the doll's head where it would make the impression that was visible. It was a moment of clarity for me, yeah, yeah. I had had by that time quite a long relationship with him and during which time he had denied all involvement and to be presented with, with a picture like that didn't break my relationship. Um, it just meant that I had to, I had to be aware that there was something else in it now, yeah. The evidence tells us what Thompson and Menables did. They acted with a purpose, they acted with precision, and they inflicted deadly injuries in a manner that's just uh, beyond words. No one could believe that two ten-year-olds could do something like that, uh, be so evil on another child. The two of them were as evil as each other. So I strongly believe if they would have got away with James's murder, they would have gone on to commit another crime. They would have gone on to take another child and do the same to that child. I wanted to hear the sentence that they were given. That experience in itself, you know, sitting so close to two that took my son's life, took my world away from me, destroyed my life. It's so close to me. I couldn't believe that they were standing there laughing. You just want to say the ones who took your world away from you, go down. 
It was an absolutely packed court. There was always a worry at the back of their minds that, you know, maybe the jury couldn't get beyond their age. Um, maybe the jury would, would, would try and find some way to avoid an actual conviction for murder. The foreman of the jury was asked if they had reached verdicts on the abduction of James Bulger, on the murder of James Bulger. Uh, have you reached verdicts? Yes, they had. Had there been a, an acquittal, the, the competence of our criminal justice process would have been seriously questioned. At that point, the judge, he took the verdict. Guilty. Robert Thompson was gasping for air. He was in a state of absolute shock. John Venables was crying. It was a, a moment of the most terrible drama. The verdict coming was a relief because it gave the Bulgy family the, 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 the justice that, you know, I think they deserved and I think it was the right verdict. When Robert Thompson and John Venables were driven off into custody, he'd sentenced them to detention at Her Majesty's pleasure and told them they'd be locked away for a very long time to come. I remember the judge at the end of it, he said, you will both save very, very many years in prison. And I was, I was pleased with that outcome. I found out a few weeks later that very, very many years meant eight years. That's not what I thought was going to happen. I do remember thinking, how am I going to tell Denise this? That wasn't just a kick in the teeth, it was a stab in the back. If they'd done some time in jail, if they'd heard the clang of the prison gates, then I think there would have been some feeling that, well, you know what, they were punished. But all they did was spend time in a secure children's home. They were in a children's home. They never spent one day in a young offenders institution, never mind an adult prison. You can't get away with murder. That's someone's child that they've taken. And they can't get away with it. mean anything then. You know, they're not, they're not even going to reach an adult prison. They should have gone to an adult prison. My name is Amanda Knowles and I was the Children's Resource Centre Manager at Barton Moss. I would see Robert on the unit, but every month I would see him in that formal setting of, of a secure unit review. He would sit curled up in his chair, sucking his thumb. It, it's like he'd regressed, you know, because he knew that what he'd done was very serious and he wouldn't be going back to his mum anytime soon. My name is David James Smith. I did a great deal of research, tracking back into the boys' backgrounds. In Robert's case, I think he's been described as an urban feral child, just generally out of control. I don't hold the view that children are born evil. Some staff had real difficulties with that in the beginning. Uh, coming to terms with, you know, what Robert had done. But with the help and support of psychologists, they were able to um, provide the care that enabled Robert to be successfully rehabilitated and returned to 
you know, to, to society. I did spend a little bit of time uh, at Red Bank and came into contact with, with, with John. I saw in John a boy that was more troubled than Robert. I suppose that the word you'd use is he looked more disturbed. I sat at the dining table with John. We were joking about fighting and I said something to the effect that he couldn't pull the skin off a rice pudding. He replied, oh yeah, bring your baby here and I'll batter it. John Venable's parents had had difficulties with depression. The police had been called once because Susan Venables had left her children unattended. She had issues with alcohol and that she came from a family in which there was, you know, known to be domestic violence. There's loads of kids out there who come from bad upbringings and, you know, bad family backgrounds and stuff like that. I don't care whether they were bad or poor, so that, that didn't give them the right to go out and take the life of a child, my child. I was just crying uncontrollably. I was just, I couldn't believe it. I thought, you haven't been punished for murdering my son. I felt like I'd let James down. I didn't think I fought hard enough. He was uh, collecting child abuse pornography online and going online pretending to be a woman with a child who they were offering up for other people to abuse. Definitely did say, told you so. When he re us, I knew all along it was going to happen. I didn't know when it was going to happen, but it didn't have it had happened. I'm hoping they are seeing through him now, and I'm hoping that they are realising that he is a danger, and he is a, a danger to society. We just had all this done up for his birthday. It's just our little way of giving him something, really, isn't it? It just makes us feel better as a family as well, cos he knows he's not forgotten, he'll never be forgotten by us. I didn't think for one minute I'd be standing with a new family looking over the son that I lost. When I first met Stuart, he, he, didn't, he didn't know I was James's mum. But once, we, once the wall comes down, you know, I couldn't have met a better man. He's just pulled me through so much. The day I married Stuart, Thomas was three months old and obviously we had Michael and it was such a lovely day and you know that day I couldn't stop smiling because I could see my family growing again. I'm Leon Fergus and I'm James's brother. I'm Tom Fergus, James's brother. Michael Fergus, James's brother. Being James' brother, it's not a weird thing. 
we've always grew up knowing he was there, who he was, what he was like, his character. In the household, we do, we talk about James a lot. We not pretend that he's there, but we talk about him as if he is there. He's always been a character that we've wanted to know more about, wishing, wishing he was here, rather than just being someone that was in the background all this time. It still is weird seeing about James on, on the news to this day. Obviously, it always will be. We shouldn't be looking at him on the news about a kid being murdered. We'd rather him be sat next to us. Going up, like, if we were, like, walking around shopping, that, she'd always make sure she's at the back so she can watch us walk forward in front of her. She, she wants to know where we are all the times. She didn't want us to go out anyway, because obviously that will always be in the back of her head every day. And obviously it's scary to think that it could, it could have happened again. So if I go to town with mates, she's going to be worried sick. She texts me every five minutes. I can't even enjoy myself because she's always texting me. As a kid, you're a bit like, oh, but I want to do this, I want to do that. But obviously growing up now, you'd understand why, why she was like that. <laughs> what are you doing? You'll get there. <laughs> I've seen him growing into a young man now who's going to become a dad himself. So, yeah, it's, it's a new chapter in our book. Through what's happened with my mum and James, as becoming a dad, seeing it from my mum's... seeing my mum's eyes, really, it is, it's going to make me more protective and hold the baby closer than you'd think anyone could. James was let down by us, really because, you know, his innocence was there for everyone to see. He was a two-year-old, so to see his innocence taken away from him like that is really, really sad when I think about it. He's always there with us. We're always there for him. Every single day, even after all these years, I miss him. I miss him growing up, I miss him, you know, going on his own little venture, whatever he'd become, do or whatever. Every single day without James, he's missed.